My dear mother, Mr. Vernon returned on Thursday night, bringing his niece with him. Lady Susan had received a line from him by that day's post, informing her that Miss Summers had absolutely refused to allow of Miss Vernon's continuance in her academy. We were, therefore, prepared for her arrival, and expected them impatiently the whole evening. They came while we were at tea, and I never saw any creature look so frightened as Frederica when she entered the room. Lady Susan, who had been shedding tears before, and showing great agitation at the idea of the meeting, received her with perfect self-command and without betraying the least tenderness of spirit. She, she hardly spoke to her, and on Frederica's bursting into tears as soon as we were seated, took her out of the room and did not return for some time. When she did, her eyes looked very red, and she was as much agitated as before. We saw no more of her daughter. Poor Reginald was beyond measure concerned to see his fair friend in such distress, and watched her with so much tender solicitude that I, who occasionally caught her observing his countenance with exultation, was quite out of patience. This, this pathetic representation lasted the whole evening and so, ostentatious and artful a display has entirely convinced me that she did, in fact, feel nothing. Nothing. Oh, I am more angry with her than ever since I have seen her daughter. The poor girl looks so unhappy that my heart aches for her. Lady Susan is surely too severe for Frederica does not seem to have the sort of temper to make severity necessary. She looks perfectly timid, dejected, and penitent. She is very pretty, <laughs> though not so handsome as her mother, nor at all like her. Her complexion is delicate, but neither so fair nor blooming as Lady Susan's, and she has quite the Vernon cast of countenance the oval face and mild dark eyes, and there is peculiar sweetness in her look when she speaks either to her uncle or me, for as we behave kindly to her, we have of course engaged her gratitude. Her mother has insinuated that her temper is intractable, but I never saw a face less indicative of any evil disposition than hers, and from what I can see, of the behaviour of each to the other, the invariable severity of Lady Susan, and the silent dejection of Frederica, I am led to believe, as heretofore, that the former has no real love for her daughter, and has never done her justice or treated her affectionately. Oh. I have not been able to have any conversation with my niece. She is shy, and I think I can see that some pains are taken to prevent her being much with me. Nothing satisfactory transpires as to her reason for running away. <laughs> her kind-hearted uncle, you may be sure, was too fearful of distressing her to ask many questions as they travelled. I wish it had been possible for me to fetch her instead of him. I think I should have discovered the truth in the course of a 30-mile journey. The small pianoforte has been removed within these few days, at Lady Susan's request, into her dressing room, and Frederica spends great part of the day there, practising, as it is called, but I seldom hear any noise when I pass that way. What she does with herself there I do not know. There are plenty of books, but it is not every girl who has been running wild the first 15 years of her life that can or will read. Hmm? <laughs> Poor creature. The prospect from her window is not very instructive. 
for that room overlooks the lawn, you know, with the shrubbery on one side, where she may see her mother walking for an hour together in earnest conversation with Reginald. A girl of Frederica's age must be childish indeed, if such things do not strike her. Is it not inexcusable to give such an example to a daughter? Yet, <laughs> Reginald still thinks Lady Susan the best of mothers, and still condemns Frederica as a worthless girl. He is convinced that her attempt to run away proceeded from no justifiable cause and had no provocation. I am sure I cannot say that it had, but while Miss Summers declares that Miss Vernon showed no signs of obstinacy or perverseness during her whole stay in Wigmore Street, till she was detected in the scheme, I, I cannot, I cannot so readily credit what Lady Susan has made him and wants to make me believe that it was merely an impatience of restraint and a desire of escaping from the tuition of masters which brought on the plan of an elopement. Oh, Reginald, how is your judgment enslaved? He scarcely dares even allow her to be handsome, and, when I speak of her beauty, replies only that her eyes have no brilliancy. Oh! Sometimes he is sure she is deficient in understanding, and at others that her temper is only in fault. In short, when a person is always to deceive, it is impossible to be consistent. Lady Susan finds it necessary that Frederica should be to blame, and probably has sometimes judged it expedient to excuse her of ill nature, and sometimes to lament her want of sense. Huh? Reginald is only repeating after her ladyship. <sighs> I remain, etc., etc. Catherine. Figure it out. So My dear mother, I am very glad to find that my description of Frederica Vernon has interested you, for I do believe her truly deserving of your regard. And when I have communicated a notion which has recently struck me, your kind impressions in her favour will, I am sure, be heightened. I cannot help fancying that she is growing partial to my brother. <laughs> I so very often see her eyes fixed on his face with remarkable expression of pensive admiration. He is certainly very handsome, and yet more. There is an openness in his manner that must be highly prepossessing, and I am sure she feels it so. Thoughtful and pensive in general, her countenance always brightens into a smile when Reginald says anything amusing, and let the subject be ever so serious that he may be conversing on, I am much mistaken if a syllable of his uttering escapes her. I want to make him sensible of all this, for we know the power of gratitude on such a heart as his, and could Frederica's artless affection detach him from her mother, we might bless the day which brought her to Churchill. <laughs> I think, my dear mother, you would not disapprove of her as a daughter. She is extremely young, to be sure, has had a wretched education and a dreadful example of levity in her mother, but yet I can pronounce her disposition to be excellent, and her natural ability is very good. 
Though totally without accomplishments, she is by no means so ignorant as one might expect to find her, being fond of books and spending the chief of her time in reading. Her mother leaves her more to herself than she did, and I have her with me as much as possible, and have taken great pains to overcome her timidity. We are very good friends. And though she never opens her lips before her mother, she talks enough when alone with me to make it clear that, if properly treated by Lady Susan, she would always appear to much greater advantage. There cannot be a more gentle, affectionate heart or more obliging manners when acting without restraint. And her little cousins are all very fond of her. Your affectionate daughter, Catherine.